and welcome to Your New Jersey. I'm Lisa Marie Falvo. Today, we'll learn how the County College of Morris is honoring Women's History Month with their Legacy Project. We'll also meet a New Jersey teacher who is being nationally recognized for his work in the fields of health and wellness. But first, the New Jersey Sharing Network saw a record amount of organ donations in 2021. Here to talk about that and all of the wonderful work that the organization does is the New Jersey Sharing Network President and CEO, Joe Roth. Joe, thank you so much for joining me here. Well, thank you, Lisa, for having us. So before we get into the wonderful work that the Sharing Network has done over these past decades, please explain to our audience what the New Jersey Sharing Network is. Thank you. The, the New Jersey Sharing Network is a federally designated organ procurement organization, one of 57 of such organizations around the United States um, that are charged by the federal government, specifically Medicare, to identify, recover, and allocate organs for transplant. Now, you have served as president of the New Jersey Sharing Network for over 20 years. Off camera, we were talking about how the past couple were probably the most interesting for you. Do you care to expand on that? Well, you don't have to go too far to recognize the challenges that COVID has presented over the last two years. Uh, in March of 2020, we also had to uh, deal with the fact that hospitals were overwhelmed and our staff had to be protected with uh, the, you know, masks and, and gowns and stuff. Uh, we were very fortunate though, our staff made it through those first couple of months relatively unscathed. And we were able to uh, continue our mission of saving enhancing our lives through organ donation. And actually in 2020, and then in 2021, we set successive all time records for organ donation. That's unbelievable that during such a trying time, you set records. Why do you think that was? Well, first and foremost, it's through the, uh, the giving nature of the donors and donor families who, who said yes to donation. But second and, and also very important is our dedicated staff. We have uh, dozens of dedicated staff who have to go on site and meet with families who are in crisis and, and talk to them and help them through that crisis to get them to the point where they agree to donate their loved one's organs. And so uh, I can't tell you how much we, we uh, owe to our staff who worked under these harsh conditions over the last two years. Yeah, I can't even imagine some of the challenges that you and your staff had to go through. I know that it is such a complicated process, but let's simplify it for our audience in case they are ever in the need of an organ. How does the process work? Well, first and foremost, we always tell people to sign up and, and make their wishes known on a donor registry. They can either do it at the New Jersey Motor Vehicle Commission, or they can actually go online to, uh, to the uh, National Donate Life Registry. Um, you can get both of that by going to our website, um, www.njsharingnetwork.org, um, and they will link you to either the national site or to the MVC. The other way you can do it is actually kind of interesting too, is on your iPhone. If you go to the health app, it will say organ donation on there. And if you want to be an organ donor, you just have to click on yes, and you'll be entered into the national registry. Why be an organ donor? Well, there are a lot of myths and misperceptions about registering. People are superstitious. They think if I register and I let my wishes be known that something terrible is going to happen to me, which is not true. They also think that if the hospital knows that we're going to be an organ donor, they're not going to treat me to survive, which again is not true because they don't know your status as an organ donor when you get to the hospital. It's only when the sharing network is called do we find out if, the, if you have signed up to be an organ donor or not. And by the time we're called, that patient's uh, injury has become non-survivable and they're eligible for organ donation. So uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a case where you're, you're making a mistake. And also less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the people who sign up to be organ donors actually become organ donors. Uh, but it's nice to know that um, you're, you're, uh, you can do something if a tragedy befalls you to help another person um, gain more productive life going forward. What is the most common organ donation that you see in the state? 
Well, kidneys uh, are the most commonly donated organs and the most uh, widely needed organs. Kidney disease affects a lot of different people, a lot of different ethnic groups. Uh, you know, we have a, uh, a, an endemic here of, of obesity and diabetes and heart disease that leads to kidney failure. And so there are, uh, while there are about 107,000 people waiting for all, all organs nationally, about 80,000 of them are waiting for kidneys. And so the kidney is the most frequently donated organ and is the one that actually can survive the longest out of the body before it gets to a recipient. A living donation is another form of donation that's done through the transplant centers where a patient comes in and, and, and is listed for a kidney transplant. And then the center finds somebody who might match them who are living, who, who are willing to donate a kidney um, to that patient or to, to a pool so that they can have chains of donations occurring around the country. So it's a, an interesting form of donation, but we specifically work with deceased donation, that which happens, uh, you know, in somebody in a hospital. If you sign up to be an organ donor, what are you exactly donating? Well, so there's a difference, skin and um, organs and tissue. So there are eight organs that can be transplanted from your body. Um, both lungs, your heart, your liver, uh, your pancreas, two kidneys, and your large intestine. And that can save upwards of eight lives. Uh, on the other side, there's life enhancing donation, which is tissue, which is bone and skin. Um, bone is used to create orthopedic devices for spinal surgery or for um, um, you know, replacing cancerous bone and things like that. Uh, whereas skin is processed into a matrix that's used for um, breast reconstruction, surgery after mastectomy, and uh, wound closure, and so forth. It's an amazing process. So there's a lot of things that can be done with tissue, uh, uh, along with organ donation. That's, you could basically donate everything, and you can save a lot of lives and enhance a lot of lives, like you said. That's beautiful. Right. How does the New Jersey Sharing Network promote themselves throughout the state. I know you have many marquee events and I'm sure some of them took a hit during COVID, but is that coming back around in 2022? Absolutely. Our, our two biggest events are our 5Ks each year. We, we be pre-COVID, we, we would hold a, held a 5K in May in Long Branch and then a 5K here in New Providence at our site. The New Providence site actually got so big, we have over 10,000 people come to that event pre-COVID that we had to create the second event at Long Branch, which drew over 5,000 people each time we've had it. So this year we expect to hold both of them uh, in May and June. And you go to our website, you can find out more about it uh, uh, and how to register and, and maybe even create a team and raise some money uh, for the Sharing Network Foundation. And uh, those are our most exciting events uh, during the year for recognition. Another thing this year, which we're going to probably uh, not do in a really formal way is this is our 35th anniversary as an organ procurement organization. So we're going to celebrate that in many ways during the year, hopefully, uh, as we come out of COVID this year. Obviously, we talked about before you've been president for over 20 years. What drives your passion for this mission? Oh, it's... It's the people, it's meeting people that we've, whose lives we've impacted. Um, this became a very natural thing for me. My, my father in the 60s, when he saw the first uh, heart transplant in South Africa, turned to me and my siblings and said, look, if something happens to me, donate my organs. Nobody was even talking about donating organs uh, back in the 60s. And so when an opportunity came for me to join the sharing network, I jumped at it. and. It's been a, the, the best experience I could have ever imagined. Uh, the, the, the recipients you meet who've been blessed by getting an organ transplant, the people waiting who we work very hard to try and save, uh, it's just all part of the day-to-day -day activity. You never get tired of this. You probably have come across countless of success stories in your tenure at New Jersey Sharing Network. Does one really come to mind that really stands out to you as, wow, I'm really part of something special? Well, we actually have an employee here who we met. Uh, 
she was waiting for a double lung transplant. Um, for, uh, uh, she lived in Newark and um, she received that double lung transplant and joined us about five years ago as an employee. And it's such an amazing thing to see her every day uh, when she's in the office, just as vibrant and alive as you and I could be. And you would never know that she had had a double lung transplant. It was near death at one time. So, uh, and also that's kind of, that's very um, satisfying too, that we can hire people who've had transplants because they can be productive and work. And so uh, it's, there's nothing wrong with a transplant and you know, you can lead a productive life once you get, get your health back. And I love that your employees are transplant recipients themselves because they really can tell the story and, and help people that are engaging with you. Exactly. Joe, this was so special to be talking to you today. Thank you so much. Where can people find out more about you and how to register? Go to our website at www.njsharingnetwork.org. And on the, far, the, the homepage, you'll see all the, all the information. It says become a donor and just click on that. And I'll give you all the information you need. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. The Legacy Project at the County College of Morris presents a unique opportunity to learn important academic lessons outside of the traditional classroom setting. Joining us now to talk about those opportunities is Samantha Gigliotti, co-director of The Legacy Project. Samantha, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So inform our audience, what is The Legacy Project? Yeah, the Legacy Project is an interdisciplinary program that we have at the County College of Morris that presents engaging programming and the events present an opportunity for audience members to learn about important academic lessons outside of a traditional classroom setting. And the Legacy Project really pulls the talents of faculty and staff from a variety of different departments and disciplines throughout our entire college. And the Legacy Project team is made up of these 40 members from all these different areas that bring in these different voices and perspectives. And they're really the, the backbone of the Legacy Project because they bring all these great ideas and the plans to bring forward. And it's the five of those members that lead, myself is one of the co-directors, but alongside me is Professor John Soltes, Dr. Michelle Iden, Dr. Jill Shenham, and Professor Dee Mackery that are also part of the Legacy Project. What brought us together for this interview is what you are doing during Women's History Month. Do you care to expand upon that? Yeah, so um, the Legacy Project offers a lot of different programming and events and speaker series. And there's a bunch of different parts of Legacy Project. And one of those parts that really engage the community and, and hearing voices is going to be commemoration. And commemoration focuses on the different commemorative months that we have throughout the calendar year. It recognizes and raises awareness and understanding of diverse groups and cultures, as well as histories. And um, for example, we have uh, Dr. Nancy Unger that is going to be presenting on March 22nd at 7 p.m. on Beyond Nature's Housekeepers, American Women in Environmental History. And so that's another great event that we're going to have coming up for Women's History Month. Now, is this available to the public or is this only for students and faculty? Yeah, it's available to everyone. Uh, so when we say, what is legacy, right? Legacy is going to be comprised of not just the students, not just faculty, but also the community members as well. And so every one of our events from our signature series to our ambassadors events or to commemoration events, they are all open to the public. So you talked about how commemoration, that's very important to you. Talk about some of the other months that you celebrate. Yeah, so we'll celebrate anything from Women's History to Black History Month to uh, Pacific Islander. And we'll celebrate all of these different months. Sometimes we have film screenings. 
Sometimes we have book discussions. Sometimes we'll have a Q&A forum. Sometimes it's a lecture followed by a Q&A. So I will say there's a lot of diversity of these events and even some performing events. So fun. How do you get the students involved in the Legacy Project? Yeah, so some students are automatically just engaged and, and are just really excited because we are excited. And so when we share that excitement and these amazing events and really incorporate it into our curriculum. So I will say we have Bill McKibben coming up and I teach environmental science and I was talking about his role in environmental science. And when they hear these individuals and then have the opportunity to be presented in front of this individual and get to engage and ask questions, they, I think they really become excited as well. But we advertise uh, to our students on, in our classrooms, outside of our classrooms, social media. We have a lot of great organizations that we build up great partnerships with over the years and that have joined our mailing list. And for these events, we just reach out to everyone and hope they join us for more events and keep coming. Why is this work so important to you? Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so my background is biology. I'm an ecologist and my background is very much oriented in the sciences and in environmental but we would have no understanding of sciences without the social sciences or the humanities. So to me, the most important thing is interdisciplinary and engaging the community so that they can learn and understand these different aspects of the sciences. And so why I love Legacy Project and being part of this group at the County College of Morris is because things like engagement and diversity and inclusiveness having these lifelong lessons and community involvement and really maintaining the legacies. You, you get to be part of these amazing events and hear these stories that really make a difference in your life. And for me personally, one of our events where I heard from Rwandan survivor, Eugenie Mukushimana, and not really knowing about the Rwandan genocide and what they went through and what she went through and hearing her experiences and seeing her, seeing her emotions, it was just unlike anything else that you can experience. And that's what the Legacy Project is all about with sharing with our community. Well, I love that you're bringing this culture into Morris County. Thank you so much, Samantha. Where can people find out more about the Legacy Project and about upcoming events? Two ways, two main ways. One, we have an email mailing list. And if you're interested in following along with Legacy, you can just email us at legacy at ccm.edu. And you could also follow along with our adventures on Instagram with, it is CCM Legacy Project. Again, that's CCM Legacy Project on Instagram. Samantha, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Phil Ross, a Bergen County Community College professor and internationally acclaimed combat arts and fitness instructor, is the recipient of the Outstanding Leadership Award by Education 2.0. Joining us now to tell us about his award and work within the community is Master Phil Ross. Phil, thank you so much for joining us today. Lisa, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to see you and be, be interviewed by you. Please tell us about your recent recognition. Well, I recently got recognized by the, uh, this uh, uh, organization called Education 2.0. And what they do is they pick, you know, 100 people a year to be honored at their, um, their big uh, conference. They have one conference in Dubai and one in Las Vegas. And it's an international organization. Uh, they found me on LinkedIn and I was nominated for this award for my outstanding leadership in the field of education for the body of work that uh, I've, I've compiled for, I guess, well over 30 years now. You do a lot in the community, empowering those to be the best version of themselves. So we'll start with your work at Bergen County Community College. Tell us about your teachings there. Wow, I, I, you know, I love being there and working with the students at Bergen Community College. You know, I have such a wide range of, of backgrounds of my students and 
and you know they just they just need to be you know we have to reach them and the best way that i reach them is through the methods that I'm, i employ with teaching you know i teach them how to uh do references properly a lot of these kids come in without much education on knowing how to do uh you know, perform a, a reference uh, i give them milestones uh, you know i'm constantly available to them by email uh, you know they can always reach me and you know now that we're back in person now it makes it a lot better so i can actually see faces and see expressions and then i can get up in front of my class and and teach the way i like to teach and what are the subjects you're teaching well i'm the um i'm in our, our wellness and exercise department and i primarily teach sports sports management facilities management as well as wellness and exercise classes, like health classes, weight training, self-defense, um, you know, the health dynamics. And what is the response? Because you, you obviously have a unique approach to teaching that maybe a lot of other professors in the school don't have. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the cool thing is that everything I'm teaching, I actually did for a living. You know, um, and in the be beginning of all my lecture classes, I play Rodney Dangerfield in his back to school uh, that that episode that uh, that scene where he's um, in the classroom with Dr. Bombay, and you know he tells it like it is in the real world as opposed to what he's teaching in the books. And I said, you know, basically, it, you know, it's a little bit overboard, but um, I'm trying to let you know that a lot of stuff that you read in the books is great, but I'm going to tell you how it really is, and I'm going to put in what happens in the real world. You know, you know, I ran events as you know, we first met when I was running the professional MMA events down in Jersey City from running uh, martial arts tournaments, wrestling tournaments, and many, many other events. Uh, you know, I've actually done it. So not only do they get the book learning, but they get the actual hands-on experience that I've had for over 30 years in the business. I'm sure they, they love getting taught in that way. So that's really cool that you bring that to the classroom. I know that you are also very passionate about getting the community outside of the classroom into shape. And I know Education 2.0 is also recognizing that. Can you tell us how you do so? Sure, a lot of, lot of different ways I do it. Um, I, I, uh, post, um, I post little tidbits on YouTube, they're free. Uh, you know, so people can go on my YouTube channel, Master Phil, and look at all the different fitness tips and martial arts tips and self-defense tips that I post there uh, on a weekly basis. There are somewhere over 200 videos on there right now. Um, I also do workshops and seminars. Uh, matter of fact, we did a workshop last week for Black History Month at Burton Community College for defensive tactics and how people can defend themselves. And you know, I'm, I'm an advocate, always posting different workouts, different diet tips, different ways to, to get in shape and get people motivated, get people moving. Because, you know, as a country, we need to get in better shape. And you know what, it's, it's my, I look at it as my duty to help people live better longer. And by being in shape, proper nutrition, proper mindset, you can achieve those goals. So when I introduced you at the top of the segment, I introduced you as Master Phil Ross, something else that Education 2.0 must have thought was really cool. What does master mean? Okay, master, it, it, it's kind of funny because I'm a master martial artist, master kettlebell instructor, and I have my master's in health and uh, sports sciences. So, you know, just people just started calling me master a long, long time ago and just kind of adopted the name master phil uh master means you know you are at a higher level in your selected craft and my specialties happen to be martial arts kettlebells and now education you just named a lot of methods of training which is your favorite wow um <laughs> you know my for strength and conditioning my kettlebells and body weight but for my peace of mind and for being able to handle myself when I need to, uh, got to go with the martial arts. But, you know, the thing is, I love where I'm at now, uh, you know, being more of an academic and, and, and studying peer reviewed journals and writing books and uh, publishing reports. I'm, I'm having a great time doing that as well. So, you know what, I got to say, I, you know, I got to split it evenly, just like I'm my three kids my three different areas of being a master. Love them all the same, even though they're all different. Phil, this was so fun. Where can people find out more about you and everything you're doing? Well, not hard to find. 
go to philross.com. Uh, you can go there, check, check out my website. I'm also on YouTube, Master Phil. And uh, I also have a course. One of the reasons I was uh, acknowledged by the uh, organization was I developed a course called the Body Bell Method, which is approved by NACE, uh, by NASM and ACE for uh, continuing education credits. ACE and NASM are two of the top uh, personal training and group fitness uh, education providers in the country. And they're recognized by the um, NCCA, that's a National Commission on Certifying Agencies. And if you're a personal trainer, you need to get at least 20 hours uh, every two years of education in order to keep your certification. So with the programs that I've developed, people can earn those credits and get certified in my organization. Phil, thank you so much and congratulations again on your award. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. Always a pleasure and you know, you're just doing great things. Just keep doing what you're doing. Thank you for watching Your New Jersey. I'm Lisa Marie Falvo. We'll see you back here next week.